morning, church. Hey, if you're a guest, welcome on this uh, holiday weekend when it looks like people are extending the weekend, um, probably through Wednesday. How many of you uh, are taking Monday off just out of curiosity? How many of you, would your boss won't let you take Monday off out of curiosity? Yep, that's kind of what I figured. Um, we didn't plan this. Um, Haley just uh, spoke about Acts 20, and um, I'm going to start in Acts 20 for our intro to the book of James today, um, but I'm going to talk about a different part of Acts 20 um, than she did, rather than Paul's discussion with the Ephesian elders. I'm going to talk about the Lord's Day, Sunday, when these new followers of Jesus in an infant church gathered together. Now, the community they were in and these believers mostly came out of a Jewish background. So they were celebrating on Sunday, but in their culture, in their city, Saturday was still the Sabbath. And, and so when they got to Sunday, they didn't get the day off. So these new believers are gathering in the evening to worship and celebrate the risen Lord. And they've gathered together in, a, in an upper room on the third story of a building. And the Apostle Paul is scheduled to be in town and bring the message to them. And uh, Paul's only there for a short time. It's his first time. He doesn't know if it'll be his last time. And so as he begins to preach after a big meal, um, he begins to realize that this may be his only chance. So he's going to give them everything he has. And as many of you may know, in Acts 20, he preaches all the way to daybreak. Y'all going to stay here through daybreak? I doubt that you would. And uh, as this is going on, the Mediterranean heat, they're in a torch-lit room, they've worked all day long, they've just had a heavy meal. Does anybody want to guess what's happening? Even the Apostle Paul has people falling asleep on him. And one of these guys was sitting next to the window to get the cold breeze. Eutychus was his name. And he fell into a deep sleep, leaning against the wall. And then he fell over. But instead of falling on the sill, he fell out the third story window to the pavement below. And the whole church rushes out to find Eutychus dead on the concrete. Paul's sermon killed him. <laughs> Apostle Paul, by the power of God, raised Eutychus from the dead in that moment. And it was a beautiful thing. And the whole church marched back upstairs, and everyone, including Eutychus, st stayed awake until daybreak through the rest of Paul's sermon. And I thought about that, you know, three things. First, I, I wouldn't want to be Eutychus because, one, I would be known for the guy who fell asleep on the Apostle Paul. Number two, I wouldn't want to be Eutychus because I fell out of a third-story window sound asleep. And then third, I wouldn't be Eutychus because Luke was there and he decided to put it in the book of Acts so that every generation would know my name. And not for the kind of disciple I was, but the kind of sleeper I was. Now, I want you to know, um, now that they've got the lights finely tuned, I can't see as well out in the audience as I used to, but just so you'll know, I think every Sunday we have a sleeper in the house. It's, just a, it's a reality of the busy life in which we live Many of you are on medications, and those make you drowsy. Some of you work shift work, and uh, you stay up late, and so you come in, and occasionally you fall asleep. Um, there's a ton of other reasons. Sometimes our air conditioning isn't that great, and uh, it helps to put you to sleep. Um, and there may be other things. You may have gotten a sunburn, and you're just feeling warm and tired right now. There's lots of reasons we go to sleep. Uh, some of our elders have what they would call uh, ADD, acute drowsiness disorder. And, um, and just to be honest with you, sometimes there's even a boring sermon, a boring preacher, and you have a million of reasons why it's hard to stay awake, and sometimes you fall asleep. I've seen people hit their heads on the back of the seat in front of them. I've seen them fall into their spouse and have their spouse push them back up. 
Um, I've seen people have to get up after nodding up and start walking around for fear that they might embarrass themselves. I, I just want you to know, I'm not taking notes of names. I, I know some of you even have sleep disorders. You've told me that, which cause you to fall asleep. And so I want you to know there's no shame for falling asleep. And I don't really feel like that's a huge deal. Um, to be honest with you, I think there are good reasons for it. Now, if you're just tired because you stayed up all night partying and you fall asleep, I hope you hit the floor. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. You know, we're finishing the, the, the book of James here, and, and I want to make a connection. I'm not concerned about you falling asleep in church. I'm concerned about you showing up at church asleep in your soul. That you would be the kind of person who would be the awake dead. Someone who has been hearing and hearing and hearing and hearing, but there's no life. There's no vibrancy. There's no passion. There's no radical commitment to the ways and the will of God expressed in his word. See, I don't think falling asleep in church is life-threatening. Not like it was for Eutychus. We're a first-floor church. But I think being asleep in our soul is dangerous. Could be catastrophic. Turn with me to the book of James. We want to look at the last series of verses in chapter 1. And this seems to be James's concern throughout the whole book. But now he's really going to bring it to a threshold his dispersed flock, his fear is not that they would fall asleep, but they would be the kind of Christian who's practicing a religion, who outwardly is manifesting the signs and going to church and, and is in a small group and they talk the talk, but in reality, it's all a facade that deep down inside the work of the gospel on their own soul is not taking place. And I think James is addressing us. He wants us to be more than a bunch of good Christians living in a hard culture, being nice people who have the right bumper stickers and put crosses on our walls in our homes. He wants us to be people of faith who are putting to work God's will and God's truth and God's ways in our daily life. He wants us to express what Haley was talking about, a radical lifestyle of obedience, a radical generosity. Let me pray that we have ears to hear. God, as we come to your word this morning, we ask that you would open our ears and open our souls and open our hearts and our minds, not only to embrace what you will show us, but to live it out, to obey it, Lord. And may you then um, use our lives as a validation to express the reality that we are a people transformed from the inside to the outside. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So, oh, I got a blank slide here. Hold on. Sorry, I had them in reverse there. All right? Doers of the word. That's what we want to talk about. James 1, 19 through 27. And uh, we really, uh, this is setting up the whole book. So this is the theme verse. We've talked about it. We'll keep talking about it. James 1, 22 is kind of the key verse that really accentuates all that James is trying to communicate in the practical areas, even in trials that we just walked through. And that is that you and I are to be doers of the word. We're to take the word we hear that expresses God's will, that tells us God's way of living, and then we're not supposed to just hear it and say, oh, yeah, that's really cool. That's some new information I can store up in my mind. That's a hearer only. He wants us to be a doer, put it into action. And he says a person who's a hearer but not a doer is someone who's deceiving themselves, deluding themselves, talking themselves into seeing themselves as something they really aren't. And so I want to look in this passage and I want us to see three actions that a doer takes with the Word of God. Three different ways 
that we as disciples of Jesus interact with his word. And these are all actionable and evidentiary of our life in Jesus. And James, once again, is just going to be very practical with us. He wants us to do more than just hear God's word. He wants us to be doers of the word. So the first one is just this, receives God's word. A doer of the word receives God's word. They are receptive. They embrace. They take to heart God's word. A disciple is one who adopts God's word as the operating system for their life. It's their foundation for truth. It's their source of life. Look at verses 19 and through 21. Know this, my beloved brothers, let every person be quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger, for the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. Now, these, these are fantastic verses. And by the way, I, every Sunday I want to tell you, we, we, actually Ian and I haven't even talked about been doing a short video each week called The Cutting Room Floor. Every time I study the Bible or whoever's preaching, we have to leave out a whole bunch of really good information because we're limited. We don't get to preach all night long like the Apostle Paul. And, and so uh, I can't share everything in these verses for you. But one thing I want you to notice, I think these verses oftentimes are taken out of their context. And they're used solely to, to talk about the way we react to other people. And, and I want you to notice, if you look, I don't have it on my screen, but if you look in your Bible, look at verse 18. And what you will notice there is that it's the word of truth that is the source of our conversion. And then he's going to go into verse 21. Um, we are going to go into the idea that the word is implanted inside of us. So the context is the word. So I want you to see that phrase, let every person be quick to hear. I think what he's trying to communicate to us is that we need to be quick to be receptive to God's word. Now the word quick that's used there doesn't mean speedily. It doesn't mean instantaneously. It's not talking about the speed at which we get to church, you know, and that we're here early and that we're sitting there, you know, um, and, and, and then we leave as quickly as we came. You know, the idea of quick here is the idea of prioritizing, of being considerate and paying attention to God's truth. So quick to hear is a person who's like evaluating, meditating, Receiving is someone who is like prioritizing God's word into their life. And then in verse 21, he says, Therefore, put away all filthiness and rampant wickedness. By the way, the culture in the Roman culture, if you couldn't tell, had filthiness and rampant wickedness in it, like every culture. And receive with meekness the implanted word, which is able to save your soul. First of all, he, I want you to know, therefore. So if you go back, he's building off of what he just shared. And he's saying that the way we often live our lives does not produce the righteousness of God. Therefore... If you want the righteousness of God, you're going to have to put away your filthiness and your rampant wickedness, and you're going to have to receive with meekness the implanted word which is able to save your souls. And so I, first of all, I just want you to know, as, as a church with new believers in it, they walk in here, and their lives, they may have been forgiven, their heart may have been changed, but their behaviors that they bring with them aren't purified yet. So part of discipleship is learning how to do away with the filthiness and the rampant wickedness of the life that you embraced and taking that off and then putting on the kind of holiness and, 
and blamelessness that God desires in the behaviors that we have. So there's a, there's a break that, ta- that takes place where God gives us a new heart. Then there's the work of breaking away from a lifestyle. Can I have an amen? amen? So we have to be very receptive of new believers who are struggling and receptive of seekers who come in here having embraced the ways of the world, hoping that they'll find Jesus. And then, once they do, they have the power to turn from their former life. But notice what he says. He gives us a command here also, not just to put away, but to receive. With meekness. The implanted word. So the idea here of receive is not just... um, uh, that attitude towards the word that caused us to be saved from the penalty of our sins. But here, he's talking to believers, and he's saying that you now need to receive, keep on receiving that implanted word that is now in your soul through the gospel so that you're not only being saved, have been saved from the penalty of your sins, but you can be saved from the power of your sins. In the word comes the strength that the Holy Spirit uses to help you put away your filthiness to put away your rampant wickedness. And he says, receive with meekness, with humility. Take a posture of submission to the word of God. By the way, this is what's wrong in the American church today. They've lost the posture of humility where they receive the implanted word as God's delivered truth for all areas of our life. And instead, they're trying to receive the culture's redefinitions of marriage and family and sexuality and and then impress it upon the people in the pew as the new way, the better way of living. And I'm here to tell you, we need to receive with meekness, humility and submission, the implanted word which has not changed. Amen, church? And it's able to save our souls, not just from the sin and its penalty that keeps us from a relationship with God. It's able to save us from the power of sin. In the hands of the Holy Spirit, when he's got the word of God as the bullets that he's shooting, you and I can turn and put away the lies that we once had. I love that picture, implanted word. I want you to think of a vine that's been implanted in your soul and is growing and it's wrapping itself around every area of your life, showing you new life, new direction, new hope, new thinking, new behaviors. What's your attitude when you come to the Word? You know, when I meet God in the Word, I use a reading plan. So I'm not getting up in the morning and looking for specific things in my life that I want God to address. I do do that at times in my life, but I just, I use a reading plan, but I have an expectation that when I meet with God, he's going to meet with me and he's going to show me things. I have an expectation that I need to take a posture of humility, a posture of not just hearing, but a willingness to do something when he shows me something. I think it's the difference between... Do you, have you all seen... I remember way back when, I think it's still on the license plates in Colorado, where at the bottom of the, of the license plate it says native. How many of you remember? How many of you have ever seen that? The old license plates used to say native on the bottom, and that's because there were so many tourists in Colorado with all kinds of other license plates who just came to see the high points. The native was there. They saw all of it. All of the beauty that you don't see when you're just traveling through the high points. I think that's what God's looking for with people, his words, with his word. He doesn't want you to show up as a tourist looking for a high point for the day and then going on to the next thing on your schedule. He's looking for a native who dwells there, lives there, resides there. One who makes the word implanted in their soul the foundation and basis of their life. Receive the word. It's a command for the believer. Receive the word. 
prioritize the word. Embrace the word. Dwell in the word. And then second, not only do we we receive God's word, we must obey God's word. We must not only hear God's voice, we must not only know God's truth and ways, but we need to have a life-changing faith that radically obeys God's revealed will and God's revealed ways. Jesus didn't say, he didn't say, hey, know as much about me as you can. He said, follow me. Live my life. Follow the pattern, the ways, the thinking that I demonstrate. So a doer of the word obeys God's word. James 1 and 22, but be doers of the word, not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. So now he's going to give us an illustration of this. He's going to say, what would it look like for somebody to be a hearer who's not a doer, someone who's deceiving themselves. So he says this. He says, if anyone's a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man or a woman who looks intently at his natural face in a mirror. Okay, so I want you, how many of you got up and looked in the mirror this morning? How many of you gasped when you looked in the mirror this morning? Like, when I get up in the morning, like, this is, this is no lie, like, I, the way I sleep, like, I've got rack head, like massive rack head, right? And I, I'm, I, my vision is really bad, so, you know, I have my glasses on because I haven't yet put my contacts in. And if I've had to get up and blow my nose in the middle of the night, there might be remnant on my face. Now, come on, no, 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 seriously, right? And I've got stubble, and sometimes, if it, it, you know, I, I look at it and I say, don't need to shave this morning. Um, other times, I, I look at it and say, I think there's three colors in there. You know, there, there's, there's the, the, my natural brown hair, there's my gray hair, and then there's food particle hair, you know? <laughs> And, and I look in the mirror, and I see all that. And then I notice something about my face, and there's this thing on my nose. And when I get close to the mirror, I realize it's a third cyclops. <laughs> I did not know this, but my kids have informed me that the, the fastest-growing videos uh, on the World Wide Web are videos of popping zits. Yeah, I know. It's gross. We live in a gross world. But, I mean, imagine getting up, looking at yourself in the mirror, And noticing all of that, verse 24, he looks at himself and he goes away and forgets at once what he was like. I mean, no offense, but I'm not sure I'd want to be on video preaching a sermon the way I looked this morning when I got up. I'm not sure you'd want to see it. And yet, that's what we do spiritually. I mean, I can't imagine coming to church. By the way, when I lean in close to the mirror, I also realize that I have bad breath. Like, I need to brush my teeth. I need to wash my hair. I need to shave. I I need to wash my face. Um, I need to pray about what to do with Cyclops. You know, I mean, we all like we I need to put on some nice clothes. I, I, I need to do these things, put on some deodorant, um, all of that stuff. Why do I do that? Because I looked at myself, I appraised myself and I took action. And yet spiritually, so many times we go to the word, we read the word, we read a command and we don't obey it. We read a promise and we don't claim it. We see a sin and we don't repent. We see an example and we don't follow it. We see a truth and we don't make it a conviction. And James is saying that we can't live that way. I mean, just it'd be shameful if I showed up to church the way I got out of bed. And it's shameful the way oftentimes we show up to the word and walk away and do nothing. The one who looks into the perfect law, the law of liberty. Now, this is beautiful. He shifts gear to the word of God here, and he calls it the law of liberty, the law that brings liberation to your life. 
the teaching of God that frees you from the penalty of sin, from the, the, the power of sin, and one day even from the presence of sin. You come to the law that liberates you, and instead of persevering, you do the opposite. But if you do come to the Word of God, that law of liberty, and you believe it can liberate you, so you confess that sin. You embrace and begin to build convictions on that truth. You turn your lifestyle, whether it, whatever it might be, towards what God says is the correct lifestyle. And you persevere under trial in following the truth that God has revealed, in obeying his word, not being a hearer who forgets, but a doer who acts. Guess what God promises? You will be blessed. Can I have an Amen. Now, here's the beautiful thing. You're not blessed just in the outcome. You're blessed in the doing. This is powerful. So, for example, many times God asks us to do things, to be like him, like love our enemy. By the way, when you love your enemy, that may not work out real well in the end from the standpoint of how that enemy may still treat you. But God promises, even when that goes south in the way they treat you, God is with you in a powerful way, pouring out his favor on you as you love your enemy. When you forgive somebody, you may find out that your soul got cleansed and they got worse. And God promises that even in the outcome of your forgiveness, when someone's life is still ugly and doesn't change, that you are transformed in the process, God's favor of his presence in your life. And the power of transformation that comes is right there. And you are blessed in your doing. See, many times what God wants to do in our lives is not about the outcome we hope will come, but the process that you and I have to go through. What kind of person are you when you come to the Word? Do you just want to stay living the same way? Do you want to just look at yourself and delude yourself, deceive yourself? I'm really not that bad. This is the way I've always been. I can't change. We all have a list of things we run over in our mind. I want you to put those away. I want you to say, wow, I'm worse than I thought I was. I need more help than I thought I could. I believe God can change me. I believe I can turn around. I believe that I can move in a new direction with the power of God. I believe that I can be changed, transformed, into a new person. I can put away the filth of my life and pursue the holiness of God. So a doer of the word not only receives the word, he or she obeys the word. And thirdly, I think what James tells us in these verses is that we verify God's word. We demonstrate it. Obedience is demonstrating it in so many ways. But there's a sense now at the end of this passage, he says, when the word's implanted inside of you, and, and you begin to let that word work in your life to where you are putting it into action in your life, there are some unmistakable marks that will evidence themselves in your life that can't be fabricated in the worldly system in which we live. If anyone thinks he is religious and does not bridle his tongue but deceives his heart, this person's religion is worthless. And I want you to notice those two words, religious and religion. They're the same uh, word in the original, the derivatives of the same word. And what they mean is a person who outwardly is claiming to be a part of a religion or, or a faith of some sort. And they, they're showing some outward behaviors of that. They may wear a cross on their neck. They may go to church. They may wear a Star of David and go to a synagogue. And he says all kinds of people are religious for all kinds of religions. 
And there are some marks that are true of the person who's not just playing the part, but is really one of them. So he's going to give us three in these, these uh, two verses, 26 and 27. And the first you'll notice is, is that uh, a real follower who's deeply doing the word is going to be able to bridle his or her tongue. Because someone who's just religious can't bridle their tongue. They can't control their tongue. They run off at the mouth. They explode in the moment. They let go. And he's saying, wow, if God's really at work in your life, one of the hardest things to control is a person's tongue. As a matter of fact, James is going to anchor us later in the book in much to do with the tongue. But right now he says, look, one of the evidences of a really true person of faith is their tongue is bridled. It's steered. It goes in the direction they want it. It isn't let loose. How would you describe your tongue? Is it bridled? Is it directed? How, how would you describe when you speak, why you speak, how you speak, what you speak? It's evidence, validation, that you're a doer of the word. Then second, he says, religion is pure, that is pure and undefiled before God the Father is this. Second one, to visit orphans and widows in their affliction. To see the people that are most exposed, the most vulnerable, and to do something to help them out. By the way, the word visit there doesn't, doesn't mean just check in on them and see how they're doing. It, it means to see how they're doing and take actions to help them in their places of need. It's more than just an awareness of their existence. It's an engagement with them in their afflictions. You know, as a church, this is one of those areas where living where we do, we can be sheltered. And why we are exploring a, a further developing relationship with the James Project, with an orphanage in Guatemala that works with abused and abandoned uh, kids. And, uh, and so uh, that's an area like, where, where, where are you participating in that? It, that's a mark of someone whose faith, they're a doer, is they see that and they participate in that. And then notice this last one, to keep oneself unstained from the world. By the way, the word unstained there, uh, I want you to think unpolluted. In other words, you have to live in this world, but you're not of the world. So what happens to you while you're living in this world? You should not be the person who's polluted by the world and its darkness. You should be the person who stands as a light to the world, shining the gospel and the favor of God upon those who are trapped in the world system. The Bible is very explicit that the world system is ruled by Satan and it's set up to oppose God and his ways. So we should expect the world system to attack the foundations that God says are healthy for a vibrant society. And someone who's a doer of the world, not that they're not struggling, not that they don't sin, but they're not becoming polluted. So they're like the pollution that they see in the world. So these are three litmus tests that let us know that validate the reality of our faith. Re validate the reality of our church's faith. So a doer of the word receives the word, obeys the word, and validates and demonstrates and affirms and confirms the reality of that word in the changed way in which they live. You know, four pastors were arguing over what one's the best translation. And one of the older pastors goes, hands down, the King James Version. It's so poetic. It's so beautiful. You have to read it slowly. You have to learn where to pause. It's just the best translation. 
one of the younger guys said, no, no, it's the NIV. It's so easy to read. It's so easy to read out loud, and it conveys such a, a beautiful meaning to the text. And then somebody else said, no, the English Standard Version, the ESV. And this was the, the person that was you know, really into Bible study. And he says, it just, it, it, it's very true to the literal revelation of God's Word. And the fourth pastor goes, I read the MDT. And they look at him, and they go, what's the MDT? And he goes, my dad's translation. He goes, my dad got up every morning, and he read his Bible. And then whatever he read, he did that day in response to God's Word. And he goes, I think that was the best translation I ever read. Church, let's be the people that hear the word and do the word and don't deceive ourselves. Let me pray for us. God, we acknowledge that we live in a culture that very easily convinces us that um, the Bible is a secondary book. It's a nice piece of literature, but it's not something we should build our lives around. We know the devil wants us to think and, and live that way. And yet you tell us over and over and over in your word that you've revealed to us your will and your ways so that we would know how to walk with you, to follow you, and how we can shine the light to a lost and broken world. And so God, help us as the church to be all about receiving, obeying, and validating the word of God. Amen.